Thank you. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the Unwaste uh, Forum. Uh, we're going to have a fun afternoon here discussing uh, the potential and the need for step change in, um, in how we deal with um, plastics waste and recycling. I think by the end of the, the session it would be fantastic if Portugal had stepped up and there was um, some large EU project that could be um, put on the table as, a, as something that Portugal could take forward. Uh, my name is Richard Bloom. I've stepped in here as the moderator. Um, I'm going to just give you a little outline of what the session is about. And then we have some, uh, a number of different speakers who will come up onto the stage. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, so in this session, we're going to, it's going to be broken into three main sessions. The first session is about understanding, uh, having awareness of the problems and uh, what's working or not working with um, recycling and plastics. The second session is about understanding the potential, the technology solutions. And the third section is about getting into action. So, uh, before we get started, I just want to ask who's in the room? Uh, can you put your hand up if you're from Portugal? Okay. Quite a number from Portugal. Anyone from another European country? Okay. Uh, anyone from further abroad? Yes. Outside Europe? Yes. Which region? Brazil. Okay. A couple from Brazil, mostly from Portugal. Uh, secondly, who's working with plastics or plastics waste? Yeah, a few. Okay. Uh, where, I know that's a very few, a small number, but where in the plastics value chain are you? Is it at the recycling end or in the production end? Which end? Let's say the, the waste recycling end. One here. Okay. I assume the others are in other parts of it. Perhaps our research as well. Um, so, I think uh, with that, I'm going to ask our first speaker to come up onto the stage. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, yourself Paul, and uh, you can take it from there. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone online, because uh, we've got people joining us online. Um, so, I'm, I'm Paul Hodges. I'm a global expert with the World Economic Forum. I used to work for one of the major plastics manufacturers in the UK. Uh, people may remember the name ICI, uh, which went, uh, uh, sort of was taken over a while ago. Uh, my reason for being here is that in 2015, I was invited to become a global expert with the World Economic Forum. Uh, at the time when the forum was launching with McKinsey, the new plastics economy. And so this was planning the agenda for Davos, and we were sitting there sort of uh, McKinsey reported that 8 million tonnes a year of waste plastic was going into the oceans. And this was clearly a shock to everyone. My own company, ICI, invented polyethylene polythene, in 1933. And you can say, well, you should have realised that. Of course we should have realised, but we hadn't. Then, in a year or so's time, we had David Attenborough and Blue Planet 2 in November 2017. And David Attenborough, if you remember, showed a film of a mother whale carrying a dead baby around because it had been fed with chemicals and so on. He showed pictures of babies that had died from being fed with plastic by mistake instead of food. And as you can imagine, the BBC overnight was besieged with mothers saying, I cannot believe that this can continue. And that was the moment, because at that moment, consumers did two things. They put pressure on the brand owners to move to recycled plastic, and they put pressure on the legislators to stop this happening. And consumers have had a fantastic success in this. So we now have legislation in place around single-use plastics, and next month, the Commission is coming up with new legislation which is going to look at the 55%, at so more than half of all waste, of all packaging has to include waste packaging. More than half. Secondly, what you, what you found was that 
let the brand owners are in business to sell to you and I. And they suddenly realised if they don't supply recycled plastic, we will not buy it. So that's all in place. That's where we are. And then what happened? And then today, that in February, we found ourselves in a state of absolute crisis with the invasion of Ukraine. And I'll be talking more about this tomorrow in the main session. But here we are, and we are being held to ransom by a dictator in Russia. And we are facing an enormous economic and energy price crisis because of this. And we don't know whether we will survive. So the question on the exam paper now is nothing to do really with waste plastic, that is very important, it's nothing to do with net zero and climate change. You, you, know, you can <clears throat> agree or disagree on those issues. I happen to agree, I'm sure most of you do too, but it doesn't matter whether you do, because what we are saying is, and the International Energy Agency, the watchdog for the OECD, the rich nations, has said we can no longer continue to use fossil fuels because we cannot ever risk being in this position again, held to ransom as we are, uncertain whether we will get through the winter. This is ridiculous. Right. So now, thanks to uh, Costa, Prime Minister of Portugal, we have got through the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Portugal has money from that fund for climate change for these activities, and so we've got an opportunity to set up a plastics recycling project here in Portugal. It will cost two or three hundred million euros, but we can move on that and we can get that going, and we can be a, not only improve plastics recycling here in Portugal, but we can do that as part of building Portugal's green energy business for the future. And then your final question is, well, Paul, you know, what are you to do with Portugal? Uh, I do actually live here, and I live... <laughs> my Portuguese, my wife's Portuguese is pretty good. Uh, mine is not so good, I'm afraid. But, uh, yeah, I live, uh, I've lived here for three years, and I intend to stay here. So, I'm, you know, although I've got an Irish passport, I, I'm fully committed to this. So that's my, that's my intro, and where is my friend Richard? Uh, that's the journey journey we're going to go on this afternoon. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you for setting the context. I think we'll just bring our next speakers directly up onto the stage. So the session that we're going to go into now is on about awareness and understanding um, some of the issues. So, yes, take it away. Um, please you. introduce yourself and uh, give some context to your presentation. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everybody here in the room, and um, also to all those that uh, are uh, online. Um, my name is Graça Borges, I work for a beverage company, a Superbox Group, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, open this Unwaste uh, Forum, um, especially um, this part of awareness that uh, it was mentioned on, on the agenda. Uh, and I'm uh, really delighted to be here with uh, Sonia, um, a semiotician, and also with uh, Paula Mendes from Lipor. And you may ask, uh, why are we, the three of us here together, what has joined us uh, today on, on this uh, uh, forum? Well, Basically, the three of us believe that language matters when we talk about recycling. So we really believe that the context um, and the language that it used can uh, support a change in behavior. And now moving a little bit into uh, the challenge that at Superbox, this beverage company that I work for, uh, that we have. So basically, uh, we know that as um, uh, beverage producers, we are responsible until the end of uh, the life of the packaging, but not un only until the end of the consumption. We are responsible for the recycling of those packaging. So a while ago, uh, we were 
looking into the numbers uh, in Portugal about recycling and even if the recycling rates have been increased, we know that we have a strong challenge ahead. We also know that we can incorporate the recycling materials of glass bottles, of plastic bottles into new bottles. So um, if this is so good, why aren't we recycling more? What are the barriers? And so that's why we challenge Sonia to uh, study the behaviors and we focus mainly on the Eureka channel uh, because it's where we have a strong and big, a big presence and we really wanted to understand what is there preventing people from um, recycling more and uh, that is what uh, you will be hearing uh, from uh, Sonia later on. But before, I move to Paula to also tell you a little bit of the challenge that Lipor is uh, or was facing and is still facing as we are. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, all of you. Thank you, Grasa, for inviting Lipor to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of this event with you and, and Sonia. Allow me to briefly present LIPOR. We are an intermunicipal inter waste management. We treat and make the management of municipal waste produce for about 1 million inhabitants. And uh, we treat waste with best technology, about 500,000 tons of municipal waste per year. Our mission is to transform waste into resource. We see waste not as garbage, but as resource with the best technology and generation and sharing value. Every day, our purpose is to build a better world. And for many years ago, we start to understood that it isn't enough to treat waste, to manage waste in the best, with the best practice. We need citizens to partake in this process. We need citizens to be motivated and to be involved with us. So, for many years, we have been develop a lot of uh, awareness programs, aware, uh, uh, communication campaign. We have already achieved good results, but as Graça said, we need more. We need more recycling, we need more, we need much more that people could be part of this process. So the problem was, if we give the population the conditions to sorting, to recycling, why don't they don't do more? Why they don't recycle more? Um, so the challenge we present to Sonia five years ago, maybe five years ago, was how can we increase the participation of the cities in the recycling process. We need to communicate different, we need to understand better their behaviors, what can we have to do. One thing we know we have to do, we, be, we can be, should be more clarified, we, you, you should use a different language, but because people, most of the time, they don't understand us. We talk like technicians, even the communication people talk like engineers, sorry for the engineers, but it's true. So people don't understand what we try to, to ask them and to, to be with us. So we need to enable and enrich our campaigns and to do different. So we say to Sonia, please help us. We want more, we want to achieve better results and we want people to be part of the process and assume their responsibility because we are also talk about responsibility. So exactly. Sonia, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Hi, my name is Sonia, Sonia Marques, and I'm a semiotician, which means I'm a language specialist. I'm someone who analyzes and decodes advertising, bins, bottles, glass, news, the speech of a politician, whatever. Just everything crosses my desk. Usually my clients are calm people. They have incremental objectives. Meetings are kind of cool. First time I went to Lipor, I had never seen so many people in despair. <laughs> I, I couldn't understand the brief. I, I, I was really not understanding what was going on. They were telling me things that were really weird, like people don't trust us. People don't believe us. People think that, after all, 
the separation, the sorting out in the beginning, everything will be mixed up. People are not helping us out. And I thought, I'm not living there, am I? Am I living in a country where most people do not cooperate in, in the circle economy? I mean, there's a high level of trust. We trust kids to school. We trust ill people to hospital. We don't really think twice about it. How come do I have a client that is a factory? And people are just questioning what the factory is doing. We, just, we drink wine, we're not thinking about how is it made. We usually trust. So I couldn't get it. They were very concerned and they were telling me people are not doing their role. So we don't have, we have really bad results. And I thought, this is weird. And actually, I was not really understanding well the meeting. Me too. I was having trouble understanding what was being told. So I asked Paula for a box of books. Can you please give me everything you have there? Because I thought, like, I'm not, this is not working. Communication is not working. How come? Um, but mostly, how come people are not trusting? You know, so later on, two, three years later, I went to Superbook, a client of mine, and Gracia wanted to talk to me about the way people don't recycle glass in Portugal. And I already knew the trouble, and I already knew the despair from Lipor. So for me, it was the second time I was listening to a client really anxious and concerned. And I thought, like, why, why is everyone doubting? a clear instruction. Why do we have, you know, ecopont, these places where to insert glass? What's the deal about inserting glass in a green container and inserting metal and plastic in a yellow container? Why are the people questioning about that? And I started asking people around me. And I had some engineers that were sure that if you mix all the garbage in the same bag, you will help and raise employment. I thought, like, what, what is this? What's happening? Okay, so I went to my desk and I thought, they're asking to separate. Well, when we do collaborate, we're not earning individually anything about it, right? So when I separate my plastic from my glass at home, no one will pay me for, you know, for these seconds of work every day and for thinking about the day they will, rec they will go and take the plastic all away. So what the state is asking us and the enterprises are asking us is something that, is, that demands altruism. We need to help. We're not going to earn anything about it. But the collective will earn. That's called a social dilemma. We have to do something for free in order for everyone to enjoy benefits. Well, if you ask people for such a social dilemma, please help without having any kind of reward, then in a way you need to code altruism. Communication has to tell people, help, please help, please help everyone. What do you do when you help someone? You get close to someone. You get by the person's side. You give a hand. You stick with the person. You keep yourself close. What, what does the recycling communication ask people to do in order to help? Exactly the opposite. Please sort out. Please separate. And then suddenly I felt like, oh, that's why everyone is like having this weird version about mixing it all up, getting it all together in the same bag, and that will help. It's very hard for us to understand that separation can be a way of helping, because usually you get together and you join in order to help. So suddenly, I thought, like, everyone is talking about separation and this motto is not working. This is not logical. See? And then the second trouble I could see was the way the communication often um, mixed words. So often, when I looked at the advertising, um, they would tell me that the garbage could help a social cause. When they meant recyclable, can help a social cause, of course. And I could see it everywhere. I would also go to an ecoponto nearby and I could see that they asked me to deposit paper. Well, a deposit, it's when you do it, it doesn't go anywhere, it just stays there. 
So of course people people were not helping because this is this is not understandable. I mean, you, you're not helping anyone when you separate. And what about talking about recyclables, calling them garbage? This is not not a way to be intelligible. This is not the way to ask someone to help everyone else. Also, as you know, um, some of these campaigns are very successful. So if you gather every lid in a big box and everyone will gather small plastic lids in a box, then people tell you that that will help a social cause. And then there's collaboration. So you see, when it's about joining everything, about getting together, then it's understandable that that will be useful to, and that will be um, a social behavior. For Superbock, when I, I went to several cafes and I asked them about bottles, and I asked them like, how do you, you know, when do, do your um, supplies come inside and where do you treat the bottles and how do you handle your glass? And they were really fond of wine glasses and they were really concerned about the glass when it was uh, only um, a small recipient. But they couldn't care less about bottles when they were empty. They, they told me that, all of them, we go twice per day and we do the recycling. But when I asked them why, no one mentioned environmental motives. Only one in eight mentioned it was good for the environment. Seven in eight did it without any kind of intrinsic motivation. They just did it without giving it a second thought. That's really bad news because these people are just doing it because it's a rule and probably one day you'll have to tax them or punish them in order to keep them doing. There's no intrinsic motivation. It's all external. Also, I photographed the way they were handling the empty bottles and I, it was really bad news when I saw the empty bottles next to the cleaning material. I know we find it all very logical. Empty bottles and empty lids and all these empty cans, we put them next to the vacuum cleaner and it all makes a lot of sense. Businesses, cafes and restaurants were doing it. We probably do the same at home. Bad news is, if you do that, you frame the matter as a cleaning matter. Well, if you frame the matter as a cleaning matter, you're not giving it much value, are you? Worse. You're putting it next to dirt. And you know what? There's nothing worse culturally than the domain of dirt. Because it's not only dirty, it's also dangerous. It's contaminating. It's polluting. It's all about disorder. It's all about evil. So what we do with things that are dirty, we keep them away. We close the lid. It will all go and be transported somewhere we don't even know, don't even, want, don't even care about where it goes. It will happen all in the evening. And in Portugal, no one knows what happens when it's not recycled. And it's so convenient, isn't it? Because it's dirty, so you just want to keep it away. And what do they do usually? For instance, in Lisbon, they tell you, like, insert your bottles here and don't cause litter. But an empty bottle is not dirt. It has value. So this is really another way that things are getting very complicated to get understandable and to get people collaborating. Also, we don't have contrasts. So since the 80s, we sorted out new procedures but the language hasn't, um, hasn't evolved. People talk about lixo every day. Is it to set in the lixo, in the garbage bin? Has anyone ever heard in a restaurant or in a cafe or in a supermarket that, do you want me to put it in the papelão or do you want to put it in the recyclable? No, it's always lixo. So the infrastructure is no longer a lixo one, but the language still makes no contrasts. Well, if there's no contrast between recyclables and garbage, then no one is understanding it. Also, often, instead of saying recyclable, what shows up is the word garbage. Well, sorry. Everyone is talking about garbage, and then you have a signature saying circular economy. That's what shows up. This is not logical. This doesn't match. It's not, it's not about people not wanting to help. Well, part of it, yeah, but please, let's help them in the sending it. 
we miss words here. Namely, we miss a contrast. We miss the word linear economy. We need to tell people this is what happens if you collaborate in the circular economy. And this is what happens when you do not collaborate. There's a linear economy that will get it buried or that will get it in an incinerator. No one talks about that. It's kind of dirty, right? We don't have to, we don't have to know about that. Come on, let's all not make a fuss of it. Well, if there's no contrast, there's no understanding. I understand what's clean because I understand what's dirty. I understand what's linear and therefore I understand what's circular. So this is our cultural view of the matter. It's all garbage, it's something dark and messy. And you want to get away of, get, we want to get rid of it without thinking about it twice. And we definitely need new images, new words, new structure, new contrasts to tell people this is worth and this has a lot of value and this is something that is it's something to regenerate. My point is, uh, this is a picture from Los Angeles. Could you please use something like this in Portugal? Landfill. Can we start talking about landfill? Can you, can you make it clear the option between recyclable and landfill? Otherwise, people won't get it. Okay. Also, can we bring linear economy from behind? From, you know, can, can we just stop naturalizing linear economy? We have to start saying it, because when we don't say something, it just gets accepted. No one will question it. It's something normal. It's not normal. We have to bring it to the fore. We have to bring it to the table. So we have to start talking about linear economy. Otherwise, we're making it something reasonable. And it's not reasonable. So we need accuracy. We need language contrasts. Fundamental. We also need some new words. Okay. This was work made for Lipor for some time. We've been grabbing every expression, every verbal expression, and exchanging it and changing carefully. Okay. Let's not talk about lishu. Let's talk about recyclables all the time. Let's let's explain how how can people help. And also, I would like to bring this matter. Greta, Greta brings often the, clim the, the theme that, uh, that we're in a kind of a climate delusion. And I think she's absolutely right. Probably part of the delusion is language. If we don't understand the language, we won't cognitively understand the matter. So, for instance, what we talk is often unsustainable. What we talk does not allow us to understand the environmental problems. If we say environment, in Portuguese we use the expression meio ambiente. If we say environment, then we're telling people that, well, that's something that surrounds us. We are obviously in the center, right? And something that surrounds us is not enmeshed in us. So the air we breathe is different from the air we have in our lungs. That's weird. The water we drink is something apart from us. Well, we know it's not true, but when we talk and we say male ambient, we find it's something surrounding us. So we are kind of detachable from the, from the environment. And in England, they start using the word co-environmental because we are enmeshed. We cannot detach ourselves from the environment. And if we start thinking about the environment that way, we'll probably be more responsible. Also, instead of saying pesticide, what about starting to say biocide? Because it does not only kill diseases, it also kills in general. And also, how can you call in Portuguese someone that recovers old objects and makes new uses to old objects? And how can I say in Portuguese that someone is a plogger? And how can I say in Portuguese that that person does not take an airplane for environmental concerns. If we do not have the words, we will not have the social importance. So when we need saliency, we need words. Okay. Nowadays, we find it common that if a friend of ours goes to work by biking, then we will say that, well, 
you know, he's my friend and he always takes a bike with him and he goes biking to his work. I, I wish in five years time I would start talking and describing my friends that go to work by car. We have to make it unnormal. So we need a word for that. And we need to start saying that an automobilista, you know, is João and he's an automobilista. You know, I'm like explaining someone, he's João and he's a car driver. He uses his car, imagine. How different, how weird. What we're doing is making the weirdness articulated with someone that uses a bike. Well, we're not helping. Language can help a lot. Language is fundamental. Language gives us the normals. Language gives us the matters and also the unmatter. But that's not a matter. That's obvious. That's logical. If you need to change a behavior, as we all need to change behavior, we need to change the language in order to change the normals. That's our motto. That's where we are now, right now, the three of us, eagering to change the Portuguese. Yep. Paula, do you want to yes. just conclude the kind of yes. movement we are trying to create here? Yes, <laughs> I may conclude, but I, I want to share one thing. When, when Sonia came to us with the first results... Uh, <laughs> it was a shock. It was a shock, <laughs> five minutes of shock, and then we say, okay, we have to change, because it's so logical, all that kind of things because we think in our sector, we think for inside, and we have to put in the mind of people and the way they will understand what we try to, to say. And uh, the second meeting, Sonia goes to our board director, our eight administrators, eight people from municipalities, and uh, I was shocked by positive, because they say, yes, that's the way. So, I think it's important to share that with, with you. Some concluding notes. I, I, I can say the lack of participation in recycling should be seen as a problem that affects us all. And we really believe that only involving the entire value chain, we can promote better and achieve better results. Each player of the value chain has his own paper, his, his own responsibility, but together we can change and achieve others, other results. What we have done today here is to share some of our reflections, some of our work from Superborg, Clipport, with the help of Sonia, but there are other players that are doing that, for instance, Green Dot, Ciudad Ponto Verde, or the Smart Waste Portugal, with the platform, a platform Vidro Mais, and so many other players that really believe that we have to do things differently, not only give containers, not only give good uh, selective conditions, we have to put people in the center of the problem and in the center of the, the solution. One, uh, another note that I think it's important, that is we have to bring the problem to the present, but the, the idea to, to take care of the future generation, it's a good idea, but we have a problem now, so we, we have to take care of the problem now for protect the people now and the future generation. So another conclusion is the, the need of a, a, a new language, a simple language, a clarified language that all of us understand and feel the question. We went up with a challenge, so we challenge you to come with us with this new way of communicate. Not only the recycling, but the environment issues. If we want people to understand the climate change, if we want people to understand that we have to reduce our waste production is the first step. We have to, to communicate in the different way. So the challenge is launch. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I don't know if there's any question uh, for us. Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> yes, so I'm going to ask Paul to come up here as well. Uh, so if there's questions to any of the four of you, by all means. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You um, I'm Ines Costa, I'm an associate partner for Deloitte. I was previously <laughs> State Secretary for Environment here in Portugal. And first of all, congratulations on, on the presentation, Sonia. I think it, we were very, it was very eye-opening, especially because um, the issue of language in communicating with citizens, it's, uh, it's very, very important. But I found that my experience within the policy realm, uh, language is also important in conveying the importance of these policies within the great scope of governmental policy. And my, my question is about that. I mean, how does, if you are able to, to, to explain or, or to provide some clues, um, how can we work uh, language within a governmental setting, for example, uh, towards valuing this type of policies, because there is a, a very much a disconnection, and you can find it also in organizations, by the way, yeah. where you have the board members saying, we absolutely have to do something on climate change, and the same board says, we want short-term profit. So how can we break that wall between, you know, uh, uh, the awareness that we need to do something, whether in climate change, whether in recycling and materials, and that uh, um, barrier that is to action? And I think a lot of it has to do with language. Can you say something about that? Well, we do have a plan. Yes. We do, <laughs> we do have a plan. We've been working, the three of us, already for a year and a half. Um, and it's kind of ready. We need others. Because if you want to change the language, as you know better than I, often this comes from the ones that write the laws. And the mess, and the, the, the awful um, mental categories, and the whole mashup of the mental categories, it starts with the laws. Um, from, from what I see from outside. And then that language that someone wrote in a public sphere goes to the private sphere and then there's meetings where I, for instance, in the first meeting I couldn't understand it. I had no clue about what I was being told at Lipo or with Paolo. I had to read. Uh, and even reading was hard. So I'm, I still find it very hard, I must confess. And uh, we have a plan to cl clarify we have a plan to change language in order to change society fast. And we, part of the plan is to create new words, which as you know, it's not the most evident idea in Portugal. But um, it's needed, otherwise it's not understandable. So if you want to talk with us, I'm sure Gracia, for instance, will... Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we're just starting uh, the seed. Um, that's the idea today of presenting this um, uh, challenge that we all live and, and uh, isolated, neither Superboc or Lipo or even other companies uh, and entities can do. So we all have to come on this common ground that, in fact, if we want to bring people uh, to the center, we have to speak their language, not our production or industrial or regulation language. Um, and so that's something that we are very passionate about and that's why I challenge them to uh, expose these two studies uh, to you today but we are open to uh, others to join this, this movement. Yes. Further questions for our speakers here? In terms of um, uh, collective, um, collective uh, picking uh, on bottles. Uh, there is, in the 80s, the, uh, I, I used to go with my mother to to the supermarket and, and deliver to the supermarket. But presently, that that doesn't happen. Uh, now we are observing a trend. But of um, how efficient do you think that uh, that trend will will be? And do you believe that we can get higher, um, higher percentages on, on, on selective collection 
on glasses of, of bottle, for instance, for beers that is a, almost a, a commodity in the market. Yeah, um, uh, but I can tell you it's uh, some good news. It's the, there's uh, already a huge percent, especially in the beer uh, um, category, not in all other categories, beverage <laughs> categories, but beer has already a high percentage of returnables. What do I mean by returnables is bottles that have more than 20, 30 lives. Uh, so they are refillable, but also there's this uh, um, uh, other packaging, like uh, when you have a, a pint or a half pint of, of beer, normally you're also avoiding uh, the individual uh, packaging. Okay, so that, that's good news. It's mainly in the Oreca channel, if, uh, if we are talking uh, about Portugal, but that's clearly a way of reducing um, uh, the recycled uh, material from, from, from bottles. The other, it's clearly reducing um, this uh, uh, one life, let's say, one existent um, uh, bottle. So I would say that the sectors must um, work on both um, uh, on, on both um, uh, portfolios but what I find at least with this study most relevant is that when for instance in, in the industry we talk about tara perdida uh, if those that are Portuguese speaking uh, understand that with this word we are telling people that this is something that after you have your beer, your glass of water, you have not to take care about what happens in the end. And so that's why we really believe that it's important to have new words for people to value, that even if the bottle or any other packaging is coming back to the factory to be clean and to be refilled, there are also other um, packaging materials that have life afterwards being uh, incorporated, uh, that material, those resources in new bottles. So I would say there's two ways. Returnables exist. They have to increase, definitely, to have more than one life. But if that's not possible, that resource has to have a new life after uh, uh, you have the product uh, yourself. If I could, I could add, um, I think one of the mechanisms here is to have a, a multi-prong approach so that you, you have recycling, uh, you have reuse, and you have redesign. Yeah. And those, those three are very, very important because there isn't, there isn't, as they say, a silver bullet that will solve everything in one go. There is an important role for public education. Uh, I, I was sitting at the airport last week waiting for an EasyJet flight and you see the three bins with the three labels on them and you think, oh, that's good, the airport is working in this area and along comes the man with one black plastic bag and he puts everything in the one plastic bag. There's no recycling going on here at all. This is just greenwashing, a con job. And there's a, there's a, there's, so, so there's, you know, and, and everybody who saw that, it was a packed lounge, as you'd expect, planes were delayed and so on. So several hundred people saw in front of them this idea of, oh, recycling is important, you need to do it. Well, it isn't, clearly, it's not happening. And so, so you know, that living, living the story is very important. Education of the kind that we've been talking about here. I, I did a literature degree. I may work in plastics, but I did a literature degree. And words are very, very important. Um, so that, that is key. But the, the other um, key, the sort of great issue here is to think about the role of the profit motive for retailers. And I, I'm not a, a you know, sort of spokesman for the Schwartz Group with Lidl. But they have set up, they, they've spent 2 billion euros, uh, they're the fourth largest retailer in the world, and I, I'm sure we all know little. And what they're doing now in Germany is they have a complete cycle. So they own a recycling company. So when you go into 
Lidl, you buy some plastic, you then take it back to Lidl and they collect it. It's collected and taken to their plastics converters. It's then turned into plastic products and you then buy those plastic products on the shelves. Now, at the, we think it's going to be November the... <coughs> A dead IT man. Uh, <coughs> uh, Inez will know more than me, but uh, we think on the 30th of November, or thereabouts, the Commission will introduce its new draft for the Waste Packaging Directive. That will include, we must have more deposit <laughs> returnable schemes, so that when you come back, you get five cents or ten cents for bottles and so on. What is also in discussion is that the retailers have said if you allow us to only collect re returns from customers, so we don't, you know, if we're little, we don't take from Aldi, we will guarantee you 70%, 70% recycling, which will easily meet the 55% target. So in other words, what we're seeing here is that the retailers are seeing a profit opportunity and that's good, you know, I like people to be doing this for the right reasons and so on, but at the end of the day, retailers are there to make a profit. Similarly, the brand owners. Why? One of the big brand owners that you, you will know well said, we are really focused on hitting the 25% recycled content and the 50% <coughs> recycled content. You know, you know uh, for, uh, for example, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, L'Oreal. Why are they doing that? because they know that for the consumer using recycled plastic is more important than anything else. And just one thought on that. Pepsi, you may know, sells Sprite. Sprite has been around for 60 years. It has a green color. You can't recycle that shade of green properly. You get green bits in the plastic. Pepsi have now said they will stop using green on Sprite, which they've been using for 60 years, because it is more important to the consumer to have recycled plastic than green colour for Sprite. So we're seeing really massive change going on here. And the work that you're doing, Superboc and others, is just so important in this area.